So what I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about um, is, uh, for some many of you will know, the, the term GoFi, you know, what the AI traditionally has been focused on, of understanding kind of complex tasks and, um, and designing autonomous, often autonomous, not always autonomous agents, that are capable of carrying them out. Things that people, when people do them, we call them intelligence. Um, uh, my own kind of focus, in part, has been very much trying to understand human expertise, and something in common um, with the previous speaker, human, human phenomena, and saying how do we kind of support uh, practice, uh, particularly in medicine. But uh, actually what I'm trying to again, bring out is some general messages, which I hope, uh, even if your interest isn't medicine, um, will be uh, uh, useful. Um, hmm? So then we kind of begin to talk about the big data, which the, uh, uh, the moderator uh, um, in introduced, and we're obviously going to hear more about in the next talk, um, in which this, this whole new set of, uh, of capabilities of being able to analyze data at scale and speed to find important and interesting uh, signals in noise uh, has become uh, hugely exciting from a commercial as well as technical and, and in theoretical point of view. Um, and so much so that AI is now often associated with, with, uh, with this big data and particularly machine learning. Um, and the promise, it's said, is that we will, we will these, these traditional mathematical techniques will teach us a lot that can add value uh, to traditional AI. And the question I want to ask and try to answer is actually it's not enough. Um, and the example I will take, but I say I hope the messages are rather uh, are general, is, is from medicine, another very big topic in, in healthcare, which is people are very concerned about how do we pr improve practice and how do we use big data, machine learning, uh, and computer science to try to improve our, our practices uh, throughout uh, medicine and, and social care and many, many other uh, areas. So let me start just with a concrete picture. This is a picture of what's called the multidisciplinary meeting of the breast cancer team at a hospital in London called, called the Royal Free Hospital, which is a major research and teaching centre. Um, and the standard of care looking after patients with cancer in, in many countries now um, is that, that because it's a highly, it needs many skills from surgeons, pathologists, oncologists, uh, nursing staff and so on, that people don't have just have an oncologist patients are discussed by a team on a regular basis. Um, and in this room, there are kind of many, many people from that team. Um, they, traditionally, they would project the imaging, uh, pathology, and a variety of other uh, sources of information. They'd have some paper summaries of each patient. And they discuss anything up to 20 or 30 patients and what uh, treatments uh, should off offer them. Um, what we did was to introduce uh, a, a, a system uh, called Credo, uh, which provided a variety of different uh, uh, services to help them in their decision making. Whoops, sorry. Um, this is the first screenshot, is just a, a summary of a particular imaginary patient uh, called Susan McGinn, who has uh, had a, a proven uh, cancer in her, in her left breast, a variety of other pieces of information. And there are anything up to 250 pieces of information that could be relevant to looking after this, this, this lady. Um, and what the, the AI system does is it, it quickly in, interprets all that information and comes up with a short list from about 200 different possibilities of things that might be appropriate to offer to this lady, um, given what is considered to be standard practice in, uh, uh, in, in, in breast cancer care. And for each of the recommendations it makes, it will also give the reasons, the justifications, the rationale uh, of why this particular um, there, there, there are two arguments in favour and an argument against why this particular uh, surgical procedure might be appropriate for this lady. Um, and it can drill down back into the, to the, the documentary, the, the human readable content that justifies the, the logical content that the computer is using to make these recommendations. I must emphasise that being a good old-fashioned AI person or knowledge engineer, this process, we're not doing things which... IBM and many other companies believe they can do, which is to, which is to process these documents automatically to create the content, which is seen understandable. This is all handcrafted. In fact, it's handcrafted by a man called Vivek Patkar, who is a, a surgeon um, and who uses uh, our tools to build these sorts of applications. Um, here's another um, example where we're not just talking about decision-making, but planning, 
Um, we, we built an application we built for the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. They, they uh, publish a lot of material about best practice in, in a variety of different fields like um, uh, diabetes, but in this case it's thyroid disease. And the emphasis here is, is to take the, the content again from their guidelines, their published guidelines, which, uh, which endocrinologists in the US use, um, to create a pathway, a bigger version of it, which is a model of the process of care, or the recommended process of care. And the AI system can kind of walk through this and helping different people involved in the care of the patient over, over time to make appropriate recommendations and suggestions. In all of our applications, the decisions are taken by clinicians. They're not taken by machines. But autonomy, which of course is the traditional objective of AI, is always lurking in the background and will come. If you think of that, that picture full of people in the multidisciplinary breast cancer meeting, the cost of running those services is enormous. Um, potentially, well, more than potentially, it would be quite easy to throw a switch on that system and just have it make the decisions. So there's a, bit, so there's a small technical step to go from the kind of traditional, some people would call them expert systems, to autonomous systems, agents, that can actually um, carry out and manage patients' care. That's a huge, obviously, social and ethical step. But the, 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 capability, the big new thing, of course, is that we can then, as every patient um, is, uh, is, is a source of data that can go into a database for a pop population, we can use that data to potentially learn how, what we're doing well and what we're doing badly. And there are lots of people who might want to know that. Hospitals might want to know whether their patients are getting good care. Healthcare organisations like the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence in the UK want to know whether their standards of care that they publish for the National Health Service are actually having the intended benefits. At the moment, they just publish them and they've no idea whether it changes what doctors do. There are a variety of international review organisations who want to know whether the research, the standards that organisations are following, the research justifies it. Researchers themselves want to say you have new hypotheses or new ways of doing diagnosis or predicting what treatments are likely to be uh, uh, most successful for an individual uh, patient. That's you and me, of course. And individual healthcare professionals, hopefully, will want to know how they're doing compared with their, their peers. And lastly, there really is you and me who want to know why um, uh, and if, if uh, and why um, out, out the outcomes we can expect from our care provider are the best that we could expect compared with other, other centres. There's lots of people who would like to say, we're generating all of this data. How do we extract that data to acquire new knowledge that will hopefully improve, perhaps significantly improve, the outcomes and standards of care? The concept of learning health system probably got its name from the Institute of Medicine. Um, essentially, they don't see this as purely as a technical issue, but almost a kind of cultural one of how do we align practice in, in many areas. Um, not only to, to support best practice and delivery of, of patient care, but to extract new knowledge seem, in a seamless way from all of the data that's constantly uh, flowing through. And this is the kind of picture I'm going to use to kind of guide, guide you through the, um, the, the approach that we take. Um, we start from patient data, more and more um, at patient data are recorded in electronic records and, da and databases. Um, and many organisations publish documents that describe for any patient what would be the best practice given the current state of science and evidence. What we want to do is to say, can we capture that knowledge, not just as a document, um, which, the, which the clinicians will trust, but as a machine-executable model of practice. That the things that doctors do, decision-making and planning and problem-solving and so on, increasingly we would like machines to do it, perhaps more reliably and more scalably than... Um, uh, uh, than, than busy doctors can by themselves. Once we do that, then we can potentially, this knowledge can be published, made available, and so a, a, a care pathway for uh, middle-aged men with hypertension, for example, um, uh, in, in, developed in Boston, somebody might in the in UK, in Bristol, might say, I'd like that to use that pathway, but we do things differently in the NHS. And somewhere, someone in Bucharest says, um, I'd like the, the Bristol pathway, but we need it in Romanian. And somewhere in, uh, in Botswana says, actually, we want, to do, we want to follow best practice too, but we, uh, we, need to, we don't have all the kit that these rich uh, Western hospitals have. So we, you know, we need to adapt them for our purpose. 
So publishing them in a way, publishing the knowledge in a way that their AI systems can consume and give appropriate advice for the region, the institution, is, is, is the next step for us. Once we have that, then you've heard a lot about personalised medicine. That provides us general model for, 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 for management of breast cancer or hypertension or thyroid disease. And then at the point of care, we can localise that to the individual uh, clinic or the individual patient in order to give advice. And the thing, we've, we've been doing this for years. We know how to do it. You've seen a couple of examples, the sort of thing we do. The knowledge engineering is, is, kind of, is, is a fairly mature uh, uh, field. What we haven't done, and we're trying to do now, is close the loop. So how do we capture all that information and, and feed back into improving the practice? So let me quickly give you a, a flavor of how we do this. The first step is to formalize the process. We have a formal model. Uh, I can't go into to give a little bit more detail to explain what all of this means. This is a, a process model um, developed in a language called Proforma, which allows you, this is actually an application that was developed by a, um, an emergency medicine doctor in New Zealand called Mark Gutenstein, based on New Zealand and UK guidelines for management of people who present with an acute head injury. And he's built a number of, developed a number of these applications. So this is a, a workflow, if you like, or a plan. Um, patient arrives, the, the eligibility for, for following a particular a treatment plan is assessed by a triage nurse. A junior doctor might do an initial workup, as they call it. Some imaging is done, other, other orders are placed. And finally, after all the information is recorded, a management decision of whether to send the patient home or to admit them to hospital is made. This is a, a commercial tool um, developed by a company I'm associated with called Deontix, which does the same sort of thing. But we start off, the, the, um, the, uh, the author of the, of the application can take traditional content, mark it up, and create the executable model. The key AI bit, if you like, of this is that we have a, a model of the tasks that we carry out, not just in medicine, but in any field that, that all of us do, which is based on a simple ontology. A simple ontology of, of decisions. Decision is any kind of choice. A treatment decision, diagnosis decision, uh, decision about investigation, risk assessment. The whole ontology of different types of decisions in medicine is a hugely interesting subject in its own right. Um, so decisions are clearly central and where a lot of things go wrong. Another place they go wrong is in plans and planning, that things don't get done. So we want to be able to model the process, um, make sure that, that things are, are followed. And plans are made up of, whoops, sorry, um, are made up of uh, 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 a number of different tasks, including decisions, data, and procedures, which you can kind of connect together in the, in the graphical chart that I showed you a moment ago. Um, the important thing is that these, these, these tasks are, are based on a, on, a, on a concept in which that the actual carrying out of those tasks is not just a, an algorithm to be followed mindlessly and, super, and, and uh, slavishly, but, but the, an agent has a specific set of clinical objectives which it's trying to achieve. And it's through those objectives and, and following, ensuring the preconditions are satisfied, postconditions are satisfied for taking decisions or following plans that, that we can do that um, uh, flexibly and... Uh, if it's not pushing terminology too much, intelligently. Um, and the, the language that we use, and leave that for the computer scientists among you, has been published in an American journal of medical informatics. So once we've got our machine executable models of practice, um, we want to be able to say, how do we kind of do this for real and at scale? And a project we're now pursuing called Open Clinical is trying to explore the idea of crowdsourcing content, trying to move away from a traditional concept of programming into allowing, helping the professionals, people who really understand medicine, which doesn't include technical people like me. I mean, I observe medicine as a patient and as a, as a researcher, but I, I don't really understand medicine in the way that skilled and experienced um, doctors, nurses, and others, others do. What we want to do is to empower those people, and potentially even patients, us, ourselves, to develop applications that are relevant to our needs rather than what the techies think you need, which goes wrong all the time. So Open Clinical 
is about trying to give the tools away uh, that allow people to build those pro forma models and to publish them and to create a, uh, uh, models of practice and share them uh, with, with, with their colleagues to test them and have their colleagues improve them put their own patients through and say, actually, it doesn't cover these sorts of cases. Maybe we can change that. Again, this is a manual process. What we're not trying to do is what AI and Google and, and all, the, all the big data people are trying to do, say, Here, give us all the data, and we'll just kind of generate the, the, the practice. We actually don't believe that that's achievable for reasons I hope will become clear. Um, this is a one page from the, from the website. You can look at this, um, which is to do with emergency medicine um, and a number of applications which are there, which we want to be able to, to share and improve. And there are a few on the website, uh, openfield.net. Uh, there are a few examples that you can run and get a flavor of what's, what these systems are doing. So once we have our library, and this may be, I mean, medicine is such a vast field, you know, that we, we may need anything up to some, some, some estimates I come up with. There could be a million of these apps or publets, as we, we call them, agents, which are on, on a repository. We're a long way from there. We have about 50 at the moment. Um, but what we're trying to do is then deliver the, use that to, to, to provide that content so people can create and deliver services at the point of care. And the, most, the reason for that is because we know that, with that practice isn't, human practice isn't as good as it could be. Um, this is just one of countless uh, Quotes I could have found um, you know, that there is that which recognizes that, that you know, in, in, in the States there are famous figures published in a, in a, a book called To Err is Human in 2000, I think it was, uh, by the Institute of Medicine that said anything up to 98, 93,000 Americans die every year unavoidably due to medical error. It seemed huge figures. I, mean, I still can't quite believe it, but that's, that's the upper bound of the estimate 45,000 avoidable deaths is the lower bound. Um, and, um, and in the UK, the estimates are that 10% of patients who are admitted into acute hospitals um, uh, have some con negative consequence, uh, which, uh, which was avoidable so due to a medical error. Many different kinds, not just cognitive, not just kind of things that AI can help with, but, uh, uh, but, but certainly uh, many of them are. Um, so the last question is, OK, we can do all of that. We can create the content, we can publish the content, we can deliver it. Now, how can we learn from it? And that's where I think the excitement is at the moment. Um, how do we take that from the information from particular institutions, particular individual patients, you and me, and how do all of, all of us inform the process that's going to improve the standards of care for people in the future? And this is the kind of picture that we're working with. It's the big data story. You know, we have increasingly patient information about all of us in electronic form. We've got lots of, that's, machine, that's structured data, machine, re machine readable. There's lots of material that IBM and others take as input and consume, which is documents of many, many different kinds, including clinical documents. More and more devices, medical images, traditionally, of course, and the uh, molecular medicine, the kind of omics side, generating vast amounts of data, overwhelming. No way that any clinician looking after you or me can really absorb that. <laughs> you know, they took six months off a year. So the question is, how do we pull, pull that through? So the proposal is that we have a, we have a task model. This is a simple fragment of a, uh, a model for the management of patients with acute asthma. Acute asthma attack um, in the pro forma framework and they use at the moment the, this, that, that model to give advice on, on, on how a particular patient uh, should be managed. The new opportunity of course is the, is the, is the, is the extraction of new knowledge to inform not only the clinician which is where most people are focused at the moment but also to improve the task model. And here's one a flavour of how that kind of might be done. So from our knowledge, this is our asthma pathway. Let me take all the colour out to kind of represent that's a sort of template and, you know, for how patients should be, uh, should be looked after. Um, and as each patient goes through, if you can see the colours coming in, we're following a particular pathway and one patient goes down part of the. Another patient 
goes down a different branch of the pathway and yet another a different branch of the pathway. Each one of those then becomes a record. It's not just a SQL database. It's a record of the journey of that patient. The decisions were taken, why they were taken, when they were done, when they were not done. All that information is contextualized. The data about the patient is contextualized in an understanding of clinical knowledge and medical practice. So the clinicians or, or the researchers can say, I'm interested in asking questions about that may inform my decisions about this patient or inform my research. And I can use the model to project onto the, the database and extract things in an, in an structured and contextualized way. And this will allow me to ask new kinds of questions, like, are there any circumstances in which it was decided to prescribe high-dose steroids without knowing the patient's history, but the comorbidities and or medic contraindicated medications are suspected. Somebody comes in, maybe a, maybe a child doesn't know very much, a carer doesn't know very much about the history, but we still have to take a decision. How many, how many kids came in like that, um, and, uh, and what were the outcomes, depending on the decisions that were taken? Um, and, and, what, and how might that, that data change our practice? So my credo uh, for kind of improving care. And I'd say again, this is not, nothing we've done is specific to medicine. We're informed by medicine, and we've tried to develop AI techniques and theories and concepts that, that come from medicine. But we think what we've learned from medicine is relevant to countless other kind of areas. So we've learned to formalize expertise. We think we can disseminate and share it. We can localize it. And what we're now going to do, I hope, is really begin to learn from that in a structured way. So what are my messages? Despite the, the, the excitement around big data, machine learning, and so on and so forth, very kind of driven by traditional mathematics and statistics and com computer, uh, computer hardware and, 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 and uh, performance of, new, of technology, um, you know, good old-fashioned AI and knowledge engineering still have a lot to, uh, to teach us um, about how that, what that data, data means. The data science tells us how to do the sophisticated analytics, um, and machine learning promises to extract new knowledge from big data. But I don't believe by itself it's just data. And there's lots of people in the, data, in the big data community who are saying, actually, you've got to understand the meaning of the data, not just a bunch of stuff in a file. And data, so they've said that, and that's what I think the knowledge engineering techniques really offer. We need, mustn't forget all, all of that, like ontology design and pro process formalization, make that explicit, to the context of learning explicit. And I hope that's the message that I would like you to take home. You know, AI is just not new AI. The good old-fashioned stuff still has a lot of value, too. Thanks very much.